You know, we had an unbelievable, talented group of individuals running to, to be president. A lot of politicians, former governors, current and former senators. Uh, and then you had this real estate mogul and reality TV star. By all traditional standards, uh, that's not who kind of made it through. And Trump defied so many of the norms uh, and historical practices that had been part of how you campaign for president and who becomes the nominee. So I, I think. You know, I clearly was not one of those ones that saw it coming initially, but as he racked up wins through the primary process system, um, you started to see that he was unique on countless levels. Uh, you heard in that piece uh, we just played 10 days ago, the world watch riveted, shocked, the Helsinki summit with Putin uh, when President Trump chose to believe the Russian president over his own intelligence agencies. I wonder what was going through your mind as you were watching that. You know, as I saw the tape of that happen, um, I was out traveling most of that day, and I, I, by the time I kind of caught up, the White House was uh, clarifying the statement when I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's very clear that there's uh, that Russia is not a friend of the United States. We need to, as the president has talked about, align ourselves where we have shared interests, whether it's economically or in terms of. But I just want to push you on this because h here he was, the American president, who was clearly saying he chose right. to believe the Russian president over his own intelligence agencies. Twenty-four hours later, right. he said he misspoke. Someone presumably forced him to go back on camera. You tell me how that would work. Did somebody sit him down and say that is so wrong? That is the worst thing any American president's ever said. You've got to change your mind. You know what, Emily, here's, here's the thing. I don't know. Uh, and, and what I do know is that he did the right thing at the end. And I say that because having seen Ben sat in that chair before where you're reacting a lot of times, it could very well have been him that said, wow, I didn't realize how this went down and I want to correct it. It could have been staff members coming in. I don't know, but I think that there's always this rush to judgment. And this is part of the reason, you know, some of the a good chunk of the book that I talk about. There are a lot of these instances that occur where everyone wants to pretend as though they know the inside of what happened and why things are happening. I don't know. I'm glad he did the right thing. I'm very but, pleased because I, I think that we need to make clear that U.S. policy, what U.S. policy is and on. what we you, believe you, you, you uh, our horrified. relationship is with Russia. You, I mean, he's been called treasonous for saying that. Were you not horrified? Putin is accused of interfering with democracy and the American but, president sides with him over his own intelligence agencies. I, 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 it's 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 breathtaking. Emily, like I said, I'm glad that he went out and clarified what he meant to say. I think that this rush to judgment, always figuring out what what I, I mean, you know, with all due respect, telling me what I felt. I, I, I've been rather busy the last couple of weeks. I got, I saw it happen. I saw them clean it up and I thought, great, that's you. We, I'm glad that you recognize the need to be very clear about what your position is and what our relationship is vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Okay, you make a fair point. I can't ask you to step into other people's shoes, but you can perhaps tell us about um, those first days in the White House where you found yourself defending the size of Donald Trump's inauguration crowd on the mall. Right. Did you believe what you were saying then, that the physical crowd was bigger than Obama's, it was the biggest one ever? Well, first of all, to your point, I, I appreciate the stroll down memory lane in the clip. Uh, I'm very clear in the book that if there's a day that I think I would love a do-over on, it's that one. I set the die on that day for a lot of what was to come. Um, I think what I was trying to do, and clearly not well, was change the focus from the number of people attending it to focus on the total audience that had watched it. And, and I thought we were on much safer ground there than trying to focus on the number of people in you know, different areas of the National Mall here in Washington. Um, I did not clearly do a very good job of that. And I talk about it in the book, what, what we were thinking and what the, what the process was and how hurriedly it all came together. But there's no question that that goes down as one of those days that I'd love a do-over. But I Nobody, wonder... Emily, was happy with me that day. So, so I wonder why you didn't stand up to the president in the first place and say, you're wrong about those crowd numbers with respect, sir. You're wrong. I mean, that would have saved your skin straight away. Well, look, and I, I, part of this is to understand that what was going on in terms of the totality of it. And you put it 
you, you, you thank you for putting it in the beginning of your package there. But what, what people miss is they look at that one day and they look at it in isolation and say, how could you have done this without understanding the, the mindset and the mentality that was going into that day? We had faced a press corps that was constantly undermining uh, our ability in the campaign to run an effective uh, ground game, or an effective data operation at every turn was saying, yours isn't good enough. Hillary Clinton's running a better operation. It's a better candidate campaign. There's no way that you can compete with her. Time and time again through the, can through the, through the campaign, we heard that. Then we heard similar kind of things during the transition. Then the night, as you referenced right before, right, the day that we start, the president leaves the Capitol after being sworn in signs all these executive actions and orders and talks about how he's getting to work for the American people. And what's the narrative? Not what he's been doing, but that the bust had been falsely removed, inflaming okay. racial tensions here in the United States. And, you and, and so if you constantly feel under attack, then you feel at some point in which you need to respond and say enough of this. And when you hear the president and other supporters constantly see this narrative where we're being yeah. maligned and undermined in terms of the validity of our thing, it wears on you. It's just not good enough, though, because actually Donald Trump, as you well know, made stuff up long before he was a candidate. He made claims about Obama's birth certificate. He made claims that global warming was a Chinese invention. Is it any wonder that the press were braced to hear untruths? They'd known this man for years and they knew how he operated. What I want to come on to is Kellyanne Conway, your colleague. Wait, wait, so with all due respect, are you, are you arguing, but, the, but you, you put that in your package. They, they falsely accused him. So that's not, that's not talking about fact checking him. They falsely accused him the day before of removing a bust that and you was racially that. inflammatory. And, and you and corrected that. Fair they, dues. They, they apologized to each other, which was very, very nice of them. Okay, listen, I but, want to talk about Kellyanne Conway. You look at it just from one angle. Right, but when Kellyanne uh -huh. Conway, and this is essential, I think, to, to your seven months, she was your colleague, when she was trying to help you understand or, or talk through the press, the right. crowd numbers, she used the term alternative facts. She used the term alternative right. facts. She was introducing a second version of the truth. How dangerous was that? Well, look, I think what, what Kellyanne was trying to do, and, and you rightly so, I think she was trying to help me. We went out, no, there was a three day weekend when we were having a tough time getting numbers nailed down and information from government's uh, offices because so many of them had were closed. They had worked really hard for the inauguration. They weren't around on a three day weekend. And so we were calling around and instead of using, uh, we used Metropolitan Police Department numbers that we had gotten as opposed to d information from the Department of, or from the National Park Service. So what Kellyanne was trying to say is we were using, we were calling different agencies and different groups. We, uh, she didn't to say we're calling different case. agencies, we're trying to get the numbers. She said Sean no, Spicer I, used no, alternative I, facts. I know what she said. I, 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 I'm trying to explain it. We all make mistakes, Emily. And I think one of the things that I talk about in this book, and I know you've read, uh, you know, read it, is I, there are things that I absolutely would love to do over or that I could have done better. I had to do them in front of millions yeah. of people, and, and I wish I could have done a better job. I, get that. I am not sitting here saying I'm not without fault. I wish I could have done a better job. I, 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 there were days and, uh, that were extremely lonely in that job because I screwed up. And, and, and believe me, I and sympathize I with that. It was embarrassing. That I, and I know the place you're coming from. But <laughs> well, thank you. My point is, it, it became a joke. It became something that defined you. You joked about it when you presented the Emmy Awards. But it wasn't a joke. It was the start of the most corrosive culture. You played with the truth. You led us down a dangerous path. You have corrupted discourse for the entire world by going along with these lies. With all due, I, I, I'm sorry, Emily. That that you you act as though everything began and ended with that. You're taking no accountability for the many false narratives and false stories that the media ha, uh, per, perpetrated. He shouts Look, fake I, I news think that, when he doesn't here, like I wrote, something. I wrote. I, but but I wrote a book that, that I think is a fairly strong representation of what happened in the campaign, the transition, and the White House. I take responsibility where I think I've fallen short or I could have done better. But for you to lay that kind of claim and make everything sound like it started and ended with Donald Trump is just absolutely ridiculous. I, I just, I guess my question is, you are his press secretary, and I know from what I've read that you care about the freedoms and the institutions and the democracy on which your country was built. And this is the office of president spouting lies or half-truths or knocking down real truths. And you were his agent for those months. My job, as I lay out in the book, was to be the president's 
spokesperson to communicate his thoughts and his ideas when he wasn't able to do it or wasn't present. That's my job. My job wasn't to interpret for him. To I gave him the, my, the best advice and counsel that I could in private. I shared with him what I thought strategy would be. But at the end of the day, he is the president of the United States. And it was his thoughts and his ideas okay. uh, and his feelings that it was my job to communicate them. Whether Let you like him or not, those were his thoughts and his feelings. Let me talk about his feelings a little bit because uh, you described very well the day that the Access Hollywood story broke and the Republican candidate for president was talking in that tape of grabbing women by the pussy. Did that tell you anything about your man that you didn't previously know? Well, I think we've all said things in private, which that was, that are inappropriate Have or regrettable. Have you said things like and, that? And, uh, uh, I, I don't know that I would want every single thing that I've ever said in private to be made public. No, I've probably said some things that I regret. Absolutely. I don't know that I've used those exact terms. Uh, and I think the president, uh, candidate Trump at that time, rightly so, uh, said that it was inappropriate for him to use those words. But look, if we're going to judge everybody by private comments that they may or may not made at one point in their life, I'm not sure all of us would want to have that, that account. But just give me the Sean Spicer day. When that happens, you're on a plane, St. Louis, and you're carrying around this knowledge with you and yes. wondering how it's going to break. Are you thinking that he's still going to be the candidate? Are you thinking it's all over? Are you thinking you've got to find a replacement? What's going through your head? Well, we're heading into that St. Louis debate when that came out. And I, I mean, politically, one of the things about Trump, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is that this guy has walked through political hurdles that would have left almost any other candidate for dead months ago. And he time and time again came out of it stronger. I think how we addressed that issue and how he handled it was paramount to his ability to succeed. So I, I think what you, when you see a candidate, uh, and I've seen a bunch over the years, part of it is how they handle mistakes, adversity, et cetera. Most candidates curl up in a ball and try to pretend that it didn't happen. I think Trump, you know, rightly so, came out and made it clear that that was not something that he was proud of. Uh, and I think that coming into that St. Louis debate, he came out strong out of that thing. And so part of it is how he handled it, but it was a whirlwind of 24 hours where yeah. I think there was a lot of uncertainty on our side about how that would affect his ability to get elected. And if I go back to this idea of mistakes, adversity, or perhaps et cetera, um, a couple of other thoughts. You were heavily involved in the social media campaign. Did you notice suspicious activity at the time? Because Facebook believes approximately 126 million people uh, were served a story by Russian government agencies. Did you question anything unusual? Did you see anything unusual? Did it freak you out? No. In fact, I, I wrote it in the book that on October 27th, uh, the Department of Homeland Security called myself and two other senior staffers from the Republican National Committee to the department's headquarters to ensure that we understood that they understood that, like for decades, that there had been attempts to meddle in our election, but they had a strong grasp as to what the situation was and that they asked us actually to, after the election, express our support for the integrity of the voting system. Because so it's, you know, uh, I, I, it sounds I, like I don't know what, what Sorry to interrupt. It does sound like, sorry. well, we know that the Mueller probe has led to multiple indictments now. It sounded today as if um, Trump is moving to try and shut down that inquiry. Is that something that you think he should do? Well, look, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure I've been on a book tour all day, so I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. But I think uh, that the indictments that you mentioned, let's look at them. I mean, you've got uh, a couple of them who got caught lying to the FBI, which is never a good idea. Paul Manafort, who's been indicted on charges for failing to register uh, for clients that he had, you know, years ago, nothing connected to the Trump campaign. Um, I saw nothing that led me to believe that there was anything improper, uh, and I stand by that. Okay, we're running out of time. Um, I'll just come to the very end of your tenure. You resigned when Scaramucci was brought in. A letter that you'd actually written two months um, earlier. Is it because you felt it was starting to corrode your soul, or that you didn't think it was going well, or you didn't think you were doing it very well? Would you work for him again? Um, I'm glad I did the job. It was an honor and a privilege. Look, I, I, I think for any person, when I was a kid, I never wondered if I would get a tour of the White House. To have worked there, I think under any president, uh, to serve my country, as I've done in so many different ways throughout the years, is an honor that uh, few get, and I'm honored to have been able to do that. Um, it was exhausting. It was tiring. I knew I was becoming the story too often. And, you know, I lay this out in the book that time after time I became the focus and a spokesman should be speaking for somebody else, not having to defend themselves day in and day out. Would I you knew go back? 
the beginning of the end was coming. No, no, I, I loved being able to do it. I miss the people, but uh, I'll, I'll let somebody else do that.